How's it going everyone? Data here and welcome back to another data cast. It's been a little while. Very excited to get one of these out once again. Today looking at analyzing and predicting the first round of the 2022 NHL postseason. Now before I get started on NHL.com there is the annual bracket challenge and I am making a challenge for all of you here on the channel the data 782 challenge. I would love to have you join the league and you know I'm not throwing out any cash prizes not quite you know the budget is quite there here in the channel but there will be a prize or two for the winning bracket so make sure you stay until the end of the video so that you can hear details on how to join the bracket league or you can check out the timestamps here at the bottom of the video and you can jump ahead to that basically you'll just have to join the discord server and that'll allow us to discuss there and i'll be able to get in contact with you should you be the winner I, you know nothing like you got to subscribe and like and do this and share it on your story nothing like that just be sure that uh, you get the details at the end of the video but all that being said i'm going to show bring you through my bracket giving you my predictions now i'm gonna make it it's gonna be a little series of videos as i'll be able to do this an analysis of the first uh here data there what did i call it data's bracket there you go I'll give an analysis here of my, the first round matchups. In round number two, we will recap and analyze the first round matchups as well as then analyzing and predicting the second round matchups. Then it'll be the same thing with the third round matchups and then the Stanley Cup final. So this will be a little series, the first of four videos, maybe even five if we do a, a recap on the entire playoffs afterwards. Uh, also a season in review video coming up but for right now I want to focus on the playoffs all these matchups have been locked while in the NHL uh, Seattle and Winnipeg still have a, a game coming up in a couple of days so I'll wait until everything is fully fully locked in to end off all 82 games for every team but all that being said let's get into these matchups starting on the Western Conference in the top left some of these might be a little surprising maybe some of these hot takes maybe some of the things that you'll agree with disagree with that's why I'd love to hear some of your predictions down in the comments as well well as seeing your brackets in the data 72 bracket challenge now when it comes to each matchup we'll be looking at the team stats what happened over the course of the season what kind of injuries they're dealing with heading into this first round what kind of series we can expect give you the winner prediction as well as how many games so let's just dive into it right away in round number one we have the Colorado Avalanche versus the Nashville Predators C1 versus wildcard number two as they finished first in the central the Avalanche did Colorado Avalanche, there's not much to say about them. They are a behemoth of a hockey team. Miko Rantanen led the team in scoring with 92 points in 75 games. But Nathan McKinnon, 88 in 65, breaking out the handy-dandy calculator here. That would have been a pace of 111 points this season if it wasn't for a few injuries. He was rested the last game as well. Nazem Kadri, crazy. That you know, one of the biggest things that the Avalanche had been lacking in recent years was having a centerman to supplement Nathan McKinnon. So should there be injury or even no injury, just that second line, that second power play unit, who's going to be there? And Nazem Kadri came in and scored 87 points this season in 71 games. So again, handy dandy calculator. That is on pace for 100.47. It's so like 101 points from Nazem Kadri, Crazy numbers there. Kale McCarr setting a new franchise record for most points by a defenseman. He had 86 and 77 on pace for in the 90s. Andre Burakovsky very quietly a in, an insane season. 61 points in 80 games from him. His career high before was 45 but in 58. But we, we should have seen this coming. You know, 44 and 53. Give him a full 80-some game season. He's going to score that 60-some points and that's exactly what he did. So great year from him. Gabe Landeskog, 59 and 51. So again, handy dandy calculator. That would have been on pace for 95 points. So Rantanen at close to 100, McKinnon at 111, Landeskog over 100, uh, Kadri over 100. All these guys are on crazy paces right now. Devon Tays with one of the most surprising seasons as well as he out of nowhere puts up 57 points a plus 52 as well just to say without looking at the advanced analytics so and Nichushkin as well 25 goals in 62 games 52 points so I don't need to go through the entire avalanche lineup. I just want to say they are an offensive mega threat. I don't even want to say a threat, like a mega threat. Just invent a new, like an Avengers level threat of offense right here. 
goaltending, Darcy Kemper has been solid enough. You know, he hasn't ever been a crazy elite goalie. He's had some very good years. He's had some very good showings as a backup as well. As a full-time starter, maybe 2019-20 was his best year. He had some good times on Minnesota, I remember, back in the day when he was more of a backup. But as a starter, he's never been anything insane. One of his best years as a starter, forget the record, just the numbers, 921 save percentage, 2.54 goals against average. Pavel Fransuz, when called on in relief, He's been okay as well. So should Kemper, that's another thing I'll be analyzing in each uh, series. If the biggest guys go out, who's going to slot in? McKinnon goes out. Landeskog goes out. You have Kadri. You have Burakovsky. You have Nechuskin who slot in. Kemper goes out. Fransu slots in. I still have confidence in this team. So just to say, what a wild season from the Colorado Avalanche. They were amazing. And they'll be taking on the Nashville Predators. You know, they have a big three of their own. The Yossi, Duchesne, Forsberg. That's a crazy, crazy top three. Roman, Roman Yossi pretty much locked in for the Norris Trophy. Matt Duchesne just reincarnate out of nowhere, just revigorated and resurrected as he had some rough goes the last few years, but he scores 86 and 78. He is back. Uh, Philip Forsberg, 42 goals and 84 points. 84 on pace for 100 points. So, you know, give them a lot of, you know, give them full health. Mikhail Granlin, a fantastic playmaker this year with 53 assists. Ryan Johansson as well had some life out of nowhere. Uh, Tanner Janot was a great, or Janot was a great revelation as a rookie. Uh, tough guy, 130 penalty minutes, put up 24 goals as well. Starts to drop off after that for sure, as without the big guns, the team really starts to drop off. So there's, there's the thing, you know, Yossi drops off does at home pick up the scoring or duchene first line center gets injured okay you can call up johansson but forsberg you know first line wing i don't know if i see anybody else Jano, uh eli tolvanen i don't know if i see anyone else that i really really believe in if forsberg gets injured or is struggling a little bit uh, goaltending is the biggest problem though as you say saros had an amazing, amazing season. Goes down to injury late in the year. David Riddick, he's 6-3-4. and four. Tough, tough numbers. Connor Ingram, I think he let in like five goals last night to end off the season. I think just like solely on goaltending and how the offensive power that Colorado has, I don't think I can really say much about this series. It has to be Colorado. And we'll get to the number of games afterwards, but I think it's. I'm pretty confident in a four-game sweep. Maybe Yossi, uh, Forsberg, and Duchesne push it to five, but... I would be shocked if it goes beyond five games. So uh, get past that one. We can move now into the series against the the Wild and the Blues. So the Minnesota Wild, what a season from them. Kirill Kaprizov, Kaprizov, 108 points in his sophomore season, 51 and 55, then 108, 47 goals. You knew that this guy was going to be good if you saw any KHL action, you read any reports on him. Kevin Fiala is the biggest surprise, the guy burying me in my fantasy leagues, where he just exploded in the last few weeks, ending the, series, uh, the season above a point per game with 85 points on the year never even anything really remotely close to that 54 and 64 once and 40 and 50 but 85 33 goals Kevin Fiala you know congrats to him Zuccarello shocking again 79 points season after you know 35 37 out of nowhere these guys really turned it up this year Ryan Hartman 34 goals Eric Sinek wasn't super impressive all things considered that you have Freddie Goudreau Frederick Goudreau, 44 points. The guy, his career high was 10 points, and he scores 44. So Minnesota is a good team that has a lot of good things going for them, a lot of uh, the right things coming together. Matthew Boldy, 39 points, only played 47 games, but as soon as he came into the lineup, he made a big impact. So Boldy, Kaprizov, Fiala, Zuccarello, Hartman, all these guys scoring, plus the solid defense of Spurgeon, Brodeen, Dumba, one of the better blue line cores in the NHL, Kulikov, even John Merrill down there. I'm uh, very impressed with this uh, Minnesota Wild team. Goaltending, you have Cam Talbot and Marc-Andre Fleury, one of the best tandems, if not the current best tandem, according to health in the NHL. You know, you'd think that uh, the Jennings Trophy winners, Anderson and Ranta, would be better, but with Freddie Anderson out, I can't give them that title. Talbot, 32, 12, and 4. Solid enough numbers, but Marc-Andre Fleury, 9, 2, and 0. Oh. Numbers aren't... They're around the same as Cam Talbot, but just to say... 
uh, no matter who they go with, whether it be one and one or, you know, one game each or they just ride with the hot hand, I'm not quite sure. But either way, the 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 Wild don't need to worry about goaltending. Their defense is very solid and they do have top scoring plus depth scoring. So that means trouble for the St. Louis Blues. But the Blues have had fantastic stories of their own. Vladimir Tarasenko is back to, you know, elite form, 82 points in 75 games. Out of nowhere, you have Robert Thomas scoring 77 points in 72 games. You know, he scored 42 in 66 a couple of years ago, but 77 to 57 assists. Pavel Bushnevich, a huge acquisition there from the New York Rangers for Sammy Blay in a second. Sammy Blay, four points in 14 games. Meanwhile, you have this guy putting up 76 points in 73 games. 30 goal year from Pavel Bushnevich. Amazing revelation. Same for Jordan Cairo, above a point per game. 35 last year, 75 this year. The Blues are trending up. Barbashev, 60. You know, the big guys, Shen, O'Reilly, not even, not having to do as much. And thankfully, they had the other guys helping them out due to injury. You know, Shen only ended up playing in 62 games, scored 58 points. But when he wasn't there for those other 20, here are these big guys up here. David Perron, 57 and 67. Even Brandon Saad, a 24-goal season. Falk, Krug, Pareko, solid defense, Scandella down there. But then the goaltending is where I probably have my most concern here because Ville Husso ended up playing in 40 games. He had a really good record, 25-7-6, 2.56 goals against, and 9.19 save percentage. Binnington's been better as of late, but really tough numbers from him, 3.13 against, 9.01 save percentage. Not quite sure what's up with them. So, you know, you got to really rely on on Huso being able to continue that form into the postseason. But the guy, he's never played a single playoff game. He played 10 playoff games in North America back in 2017 in the AHL. But besides that, all of experience is um, in Europe. Jordan Binnington, on the other hand, has back-to-back first-round exits, but a Stanley Cup, 26 games in 2019. He had crazy numbers back then. His numbers have slightly gone down since, this year being the worst, but can he turn back on the Jets in the playoffs? That's the question. So goaltending, a bit of a concern for me when it comes to the Blues. Their defense is solid, and their scoring is there. So it's a bit of a toss-up. This is a very difficult matchup right now. These two teams are both hot. They're both they're both solid teams. I don't see any blatant weaknesses in either of them. But that being said, looking at the matchup here, it might just come down to the goals against per game because the goals for are very similar. And yes, the Blues have the advantage in goals against. But I think with Marc Andre Fleury. If he's going to be their guy, I, you know, obviously no one is certain. It could be him or Talbot playing games one, two, so forth. But I think Fleury turns on the Jets, and I'm not sure if I believe in Husso and Bennington. Husso had good regular season numbers. I don't want to think of it all in my franchise mode mind where, you know, things totally change in the playoffs. Like if a guy's good on game 82, he'll still be good on playoff game number one a couple of days later. But just to say, I'm not quite sold on Ville Husso. Something in my brain is not allowing me to be sold on him. So I think I'm going to lean with the Minnesota Wild in a seven-game thriller. I don't say that easily. This series could go either way. There's a few of these series, which I'll get to later, that could go either way in seven games. I think the Wild take it, and that's what I'll say for, game, for this uh, second matchup in the West. Now, moving on to the next matchup, it's the Calgary Flames and the Dallas Stars. Calgary Flames, another team like the Avalanche that I don't have much to say about because it's just that crazy. Johnny Goudreau, 115 points. Kachuk, 104 points. You have three 40-goal scorers. Another guy in Andrew Manjapane with 35 goals. He's slowed down, but still 35 goals and 55 points. Elias Lindholm, point per game, one of the most quiet superstars in the league. Rasmus Anderson, this is where it might come down to here. The defense on both teams, because Dallas, yes, you have Pavelski, you have Robertson, uh, you have Hints even. Tyler Sagan dropped off. Really tough year from Alex Radulov, who had 22 points. But the defensive scoring may be where uh, Calgary has the edge because you have John Klingberg, yes. You have Miro Heiskanen, but 36 and 70, 32 and 82 from Ryan Suter. I'm really liking Rasmus Anderson and Noah Hannafin, 50 and 48 points respectively. Even a little bit from Oliver Shillington and Chris Tanev, who are putting up the same numbers as Ryan Suter and, um, and Miro Heiskanen. Uh, add 23 points in 37 games from Tyler Toffoli, who was that trade deadline pickup, a really, really solid pickup. And their top two lines, plus their top two defensive pairs, their top six and their top four, 
is pretty crazy, I do have to say. Goudreau, Kachuk, Lindholm, Manjapane, Backlund, and maybe Coleman on the wing or Toffoli on the wing. Plus, that even leaves more for the third line. The, the Flames are going to be a team to be reckoned with. They are on a mission. Goaltending's been amazing. Markstrom's going to get Vezina votes, 2.22 goals against, 9.22 save percentage, 9 shutouts on the year. If he's dialed in and the scoring continues as it has shown it to be capable to do, I think the Flames take this series and relatively easily as well, I'm sorry to say. Yes, Pavelski, almost a point per game. Yes, Jason Robertson, wow, 41 goals. But they haven't had enough from Sagan, Ben, uh, Radulov, they haven't had enough from them. So unless these guys really turn back the clock and go crazy out of nowhere in the playoffs, the team is trending down, and I don't think I can side with them right now. Goaltending, Jake Ottinger's been okay. He's been more than okay, actually. But again, another guy who only has a couple games of playoff experience in his life. It's his first time being a starter. Uh, I don't think I can see that Stars pulling this one off against the Flames. It would be one of the biggest upsets if they did, but I got to say this one's probably a four or five game series. We'll lock it in in a couple minutes. I got to give it to Calgary there. Next, we move on to the Oilers. And also, if you're interested in seeing the matchup here, crazy when you look at the goals for it, but the goals against also quite uh, quite a divide between these two teams. I think it's got to be Calgary. I didn't look at the one here on Nashville and Colorado, but once again, there are those numbers if you're interested in seeing the, the matchup analysis. Now we get to the Oilers and the Kings. Honestly, this was a tough one for me. This was a tough one. Connor McDavid, Leon Dreisaitl, again, guys you don't need to say anything about. 123 points, an Art Ross season for, uh, for uh, McDavid. Leon Dreisaitl, he can be a runner-up in the Rocket Richard. 55 goals, 55 assists, crazy numbers. Zach Hyman, 27 goals, 54 points, pretty quietly put up a solid season for himself. Many people thought he was going to be like an 80-point guy with McDavid, but I think when expectations came down a little bit and the dust settled, a 27-goal season is still pretty solid from Zach Hyman, a career high in goals and a career high in points. So I think people were expecting a bit too much of him. He still had a solid year. Ryan Nugent Hopkins, 50 assists, excuse me, 50 points in 63 games times 50. 50 that gives him on pace for a 65 point season good stuff from him evan bouchard great revelation there on the blue line 43 points with tyson berry 41 i like their scoring here kyler yamamoto had a good end to the season evander kane not a fan of evander kane at all but you do have to say they have, just looking at the points he was almost point per game since he joined the team so he'll be helpful for them puyo yarvi yeah 36 and 65 you thought you thought he was going to be a top line guy didn't quite turn out uh, Darnell Nurse was an unfortunate thing, uh, well, unfortunate uh, letdown, as he only scored 35 points in 71 games after last year, putting up uh, 36 in 56, so you thought that he was going to get at least 40 or 50, or at least into the 50s, I would think. But Darnell Nurse is injured as well heading into the playoffs, which is going to be difficult for the Oilers. Uh, they, they are trying their best in the blue line. They have Cody CC. they have Duncan Keith, who's still alive somehow. He'll have to play a bigger role in the team moving forward, so that's going to be difficult for him at his age, I think, unless, you know, again, some of these guys in the playoffs, they really turn it up. Uh, Chris Russell, Brett Kulak, who they picked up from the Canadians at the deadline, you got to really hope that these guys are the ones who will uh, just step up, in, for lack of a better term. Def uh, goaltending, Mike Smith on like a, what, 9 or 10 game winning streak to end the year, he's been pretty crazy. 2.81 goals against average, 0.915 save percentage. Those numbers are a bit skewed because of the earlier season woes. Mikko Koskinen as a backup, and Mike Smith being injury prone is what scares me a little bit in this series. But it may just be the firepower of McDavid and Drysaddle that pulls this Edmonton team through and out of this fire, you know, this dumpster fire of of a failure in the last few years, uh, multiple years in the playoffs. The LA Kings, this is an interesting team. The Kings, I, I don't think anyone really expected them to even be here in the playoffs. And, you know, Anze Kopitar had a good enough season, but it's a bit odd to see that their top scorer had only 67 points and they had as good of a record as they did. They ended, um, let's see over here, they were 44-27-7, and seven, a 44-win season from a guy who didn't even really come super close to point a game. That's interesting. Very similar to the Oilers, but they have two guys who are well over a point per game. So the Kings have Kopitar. Kempe was a great revelation. 35 goals from him. Philippe Dano. Love me some Philippe Dano. He had a great 51-point season. Was that a career high for him in 51? No, 53 is career high, but uh, much better than what he had been doing the last couple of years on the Canadians. Victor Arvidsson, 49 points. 
you know, I used to think of Arvidsson as one of the better snipers in the league, you know, 2016, 2017, 2018. Last few years have been difficult, but a 20-goal season, 49 points is nice to see. He's getting back to his old self. Trevor Moore, some surprising names. Trevor Moore, Alex Iafalo. Drew Doughty being out is going to be a huge problem for the Kings. Uh, Dustin Brown, maybe they fight for Dustin Brown as his last postseason before he retires. Um, maybe that gives the team a little bit of a spark. I love Arthur Kaliev. I love some of these younger guys, Byfield, Gabe Velarde, but it's still a young team. And, and I know you have the playoff experience from guys like Kopitar and Jonathan Quick. If Jonathan Quick can turn back the clock and become vintage, then, then who knows what happens. But I wanted to say Kings in seven initially when I first thought about this. But when I looked at, you know, based on Edmonton's struggles, plus LA being a surprise team and they really want to get it done for Dustin Brown and everything, I'm not see sure if I can see the Oilers choking it hard enough. Maybe, I think it goes to six or seven games. I don't think the Edmonton Oilers take it in four or five like you would think based on the numbers. But I think it's going to be an all-Canadian matchup in round number two. So getting to the number of games now, and it's, in, it's unfortunate because I really want the Kings to do well. And if they did win, I'd be very happy. I'd be happy to be proven wrong. In this first round, I'm going to say five games between the Avalanche and the Predators solely because Yossi, Forsberg, and uh, Duchesne might steal one. But the goaltending is going to have to stand on its head, and I really would be shocked to see it go beyond five. I think five's even pushing it. In this next one between the Wild and the Blues, I see it going all the way to seven. Same thing in game uh, for five games here between the Flames and the Stars. I, I'd be pretty surprised to see it go beyond that unless Radulov and Sagan are going to wake up out of nowhere, but I think the Flames are just way too strong. And same thing between the Oilers and the Kings. I think the Kings are going to give them a run for their money. They're going to push it to seven, but ultimately, I think that McDavid and Dreisaitl are finally going to get out of the first round. So there are the predictions for the first round over in the West. Over in the Eastern Conference now, starting with the Panthers and the Capitals, another series where I think, you know, I'm not going not, I'm not, I'm 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 to keep you hanging. I, I think Florida's going to take it. But I think it's going to be a bit closer than most people think. Great season for Florida again. Jonathan Huberdeau, 80 more assists than the games played, 115 points. Barkov, crazy year from him as well. He would have been on pace for 108 points. Sam Reinhardt was amazing. Great pickup from the Buffalo Sabres. Anthony Duclair, solid 31 goal campaign out of nowhere. Career high of 23 goes up to 31. He is a solid player, a very good skater, a good sniper, great hands, and put him on the right team, and that's what people saw this season. So I'm glad Duclair had a good year. Aaron Ekblad being out, that's what really hurts the most. I've read that maybe Ekblad plays in the first round. The thing is, even if he doesn't, it's a huge blow. But Mackenzie Weger has been solid. Gustav Forsling has been very good. And even Brandon Montour in a top four role has been great. Radko Gudis, despite the 105 points, has still been uh, a wrecking ball, as always. Back up to the top, though, Carter Verhage has had a good year. Sam Bennett's had a 28-goal season. Anton Ludell, very quietly, 44 points in 65 games. Patrick Hornquist, still alive, 28 points from the 34-year-old. Uh, speaking of age, Joe Thornton at 42, scores 10 points in 34 games. So, I would love the Panthers. I really, really want the Panthers to do well for Thornton especially, but for so many great names on this team, I really want Joey to do it. Uh, goaltending, this is the dicey part for the Panthers. Sergei Bobrovsky and Spencer Knight. Johansson shellacked and bombarded for 10 goals against the Canadians last game, but Bobrovsky and Knight. Bobrovsky doesn't have a great track record in the playoffs. In 2019, he went to the second round with the Blue Jackets on that crazy run that they have, but he's been you know, a career first round kind of guy. Spencer Knight, on the other hand, has no experience as a rookie. Uh, Bobrovsky's numbers are better. He is their starter. He's going to be the guy in the first round unless he falters. Can you trust Sergei Bobrovsky? That's tough. Maybe with the type of numbers that his team is putting up, you can. But I don't know. I don't know. Meanwhile, you have the floor, the uh, Washington Capitals. You have 35-year-old Alex Ovechkin who got another 50-goal campaign. You have Kuznetsov, another point-per-game year. You have John Carlson, who if it wasn't for Roman Yossi and Kale McCarr would be at the front of the Norris conversation, 71 points in 78 games. Tom Wilson, 52 points. Connor Sheary, the depth scoring has been okay. Sheary, Eller, even Hathaway a little bit. Well, you know what? 
Hathaway had a little fat, a little hot stretch, but I'm not going to say that he was anything too crazy. It's 26 points in 76 games. You have Nick Backstrom at full health now, so 82 blah, 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 times 31. He was on pace for a 54-point season. Definitely a more quiet year by his standard, but still a 54-point season would have put him fourth in team scoring. TJ Oshie, 25 points from him would have put him on pace for 47 points. Uh, Anthony Mantha, of course, he was injured as well. That's another 51-point pace for him. So if it wasn't for injury, I think the Capitals would have done better than they did, being you know the second wildcard team. And couple that with their playoff experience, I think they're going to give uh, Florida a run for their money. Goaltending-wise, that's, again, where it's been a bit difficult. Vitek Vanacek, 20-12-6. and six. Ilya Samsonov, 23-12-5. and five. Neither of them with crazy good numbers. Vanacek with the edge. I'd say he's probably the starter headed into the playoffs, 2.6. 6-7 against, 908 save percentage. Do I believe in Vanacek? And do I believe, kind of like the Edmonton series with the Kings, how much does experience really come into it? Can Ovechkin really just pull his team like Ovechkin and Dreisaitl are? Can Kuznetsov and now the full health Anthony Mantha, Nicholas Backstrom, can they do something about it? I think Florida takes it. Again, they're just so much firepower. They have solid goaltending, even if he struggles a little bit in Sergei Bobrovsky. They have a good blue line. Yes, Washington has John Carlson, Dmitry Orlov. I think I give the edge to Florida, but especially if Ekblad comes back, which he should sometime in the series. I'm going to go Florida, but honestly, I think this is going to six or seven games. I think I'm going to lock in seven even. Washington's going to give Florida a little bit of a scare in this first round, but Florida will come through. Of course, with the matchup here again, we see the Panthers a crazy high-scoring team, but when it comes to goals against, it's pretty similar. So that's why I think another reason why it's going to be a closer series than many think. Next series in the Eastern Conference, Toronto Maple Leafs versus the Tampa Bay Lightning. So Toronto, of course, Austin Matthews, a heart caliber season, 60 goals, 106 points. That would have been on pace for 119. Mitch Marner, 97. Nylander, out of nowhere, well, out of nowhere, but I think a surprising 80-point season when his career high was in the 60s. He jumps over the 70s and goes straight to an 80-point year. So I'm very impressed with William Nylander. John Tavares, 76 and 79. Morgan Riley, very good year. Again, if it wasn't for guys like Yossi and Makar, I think he would also be in the Norris conversation. 68 points in 82 games. Michael Bunting, one of the luckiest guys in the league. I'm not going to say it's all luck, but I'm sure there's a little bit of him counting his lucky stars when he goes home at night to be playing with Austin Matthews, who's scoring 60 goals. He had a 63-point uh, season, Michael Bunting did. Alex Kerfoot, Pierre Engvall, very underrated player. I love Pierre Engvall. Those are the type of guys that the Maple Leafs are going to need against the Tampa Bay Lightning, because the Lightning, when it comes to their depth, they have all kinds of random guys that you just say, oh, Ross Colton, he had like a 40-point year. Oh, okay. Oh, Nick Ball, he scored 14 points in 21 games. Oh, wow. You need guys like Pierre Engvall. You need guys like David Kampf who can wake up a little bit. Maybe even Jason Spezza who brings some of that experience. I think a big issue for the Maple Leafs will be their defense and goaltending. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not the first person to say that. Morgan Riley, elite, yes. TJ Brody, okay, he's been oh, he's been good. I'm not just looking at the points, but just to say, oh, Timothy Liljegren and Justin Hall, your second second pair okay Rasmus Sandin eh, Jake Muzzin okay Jake Muzzin's back to full health put him on the second pair okay now my third pair is Sandin and Giordano okay can he keep up he's been good okay so it's not super scary but one injury and now Labushkin has to slot in or Sandin's getting more ice time than he should that's where it gets a little bit scary on paper Riley Muzzin Giordano Brody that's a good top four no problem Lilligren Hall third pair okay but one thing goes wrong, and then, uh, you know, Jack Campbell, he's been so good in the regular season. I don't know. If anything happens to him, you go to Eric Schalgren. Is he going to be really anything for you? 888 save percentage. So Jack Campbell has a ton of pressure on his shoulders. He has the seven-game defeat against the Canadians last year haunting him. His numbers were even better last year in 22 games. And he lost in seven. His numbers are a little worse this year. Of course, over twice as many games. Does he have the 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 ability to stop the high-scoring two-time Stanley Cup champion uh, Tampa Bay Lightning? who have Steven Stankos who scored like 30 points in the last two weeks, who have 85-point Victor Hedman, who have 69 points in 47 games Nikita Kucherov, 
who would have been on pace for times 69, would have been on pace for 120 points. Alex Kalorn quietly 59 points. Braden Point 58 and 66. Palat 49. The depth there. Corey Perry a 40 point year. Then Colton, Sergachev, the blue line again. You have Sergachev, you have Hedman, you have McDonough. And you look at their acquisitions. Like I said, Nick Paul, depth guy, 14 points in 21 games. So good. Hagel's been okay, 7 points in 22 points. Not quite what they expected him to be. But just saying, there's so much firepower in the Lightning. Coupled with the fact that Toronto has a very difficult record in the Stanley Cup playoffs, to say the least, to put that very kindly. Andre Vasilevsky, Vezina caliber season, backed up by Brian Elliott, who's been good. If Elliott needs to go in there, I'm not super afraid. His, you know, forget the record again. 9-12 save percentage, 2.43 goals against, serviceable enough. Shalgren, 888. I don't know. I don't know. So I'll have to say, yes, the Maple Leafs have the firepower, but I'm not sure about their defense. Against almost anyone else, I think I'd give Toronto the edge, but against Tampa Bay, I just can't. They're way too strong. Their players are red hot, white hot, whatever, whatever color you want to call them. They are very hot coming into the playoffs. I think it has to be Tampa Bay, and I'm not even convinced that it's going to be a long series. Toronto, it could be tight games maybe, but Toronto, I don't see them getting out of, this, uh, of the first round this year. The matchup analytics here tell us that, yes, Toronto scores a lot of goals. Tampa's better defensively, and I think 3.44 against uh, per game against a team that allows 3.09, I think Tampa takes it. And uh, it's unfortunate for the Leafs fans, but we'll revisit this later on. Now, the Hurricanes and the Bruins. The Carolina Hurricanes, great year from them, of course. Aho, Sveshnikov, Teravine in the top dogs. Tony D'Angelo, 51 and 64. Vinny Trocek, a solid 50 point year. Nino Niederreiter, a little life out of nowhere, 24 goals from him. He had some difficulties the last couple. Yeah, it's been a few, it's been a while since we've seen 40 some points for Nino Niederreiter, so that's good to see from the Hurricanes sniper. Uh, Slavin, one of the best defensemen in the NHL. Seth Jarvis, a rookie revelation. Martin Natchez, not quite what they were hoping from him, but still a solid enough year. Kakanyemi, not what they were hoping from him either. Uh, Max Domi, seven points in 19 games, a trade deadline acquisition. He's been all right. Here's the biggest thing, though. Freddie Anderson and Antti Ranta. Uh, this was one of my hot takes at the beginning of the season. I said that Anderson and Ranta were going to be one of the best, if not the best, goaltending tandem in the NHL, and they won the Jennings Trophy. Yeah. Anderson going to be the Vezina runner-up, I think, probably to Igor Shosturkin. 2.17 goals against average, 9.22 save percentage, 35-14-3 and with four shutouts. Probably going to be like Shosturkin, Anderson, maybe even Markstrom in there, uh, uh, Vasilevsky in there with all those shutouts from, um, from Anderson. But Antti Ranta, he's been good. He's been very good. It's just that he's getting a lot on his plate now he has a 912 save percentage he's allowed 2.45 goals against per game there uh, it's gonna be tight it's gonna be tight without freddie anderson anti ranta having to be the starter in the playoffs going up against a tough boston bruins team that has a lot of experience in the playoffs marsha bergeron these guys have experience Pasternak's at full health. Uh, Bergeron's been hot to end the season. Just had a hat-trick the other night. Taylor Hall's turning it up as well. He had a 61-point year. Charlie McAvoy, great season, plus 31. Eric Howla's been good depth. You know, that's the thing, though. Again, Patrice Bergeron goes out. Eric Howla becomes first-line center. Do I believe in Eric Howla? I don't know. Jake DeBrusque went down hard yesterday. I'm not sure if he'll be ready for game one, but he had a 25-goal season. Matt Grizzlick's been okay. It's Down here is where I'm not totally sold in the team. Nick Foligno, he didn't really do anything for their down in depth. Curtis Lazar didn't do much down there in depth. Uh, that's where I'm a bit scared. Boston has always, not always, but the last few years, they've been known as this one-line kind of team. Take out Marshawn, Pasternak, and Bergeron. You take out one of those players who slots up. Before that, the before the Bruins had Taylor Hall, it was kind of nobody. Now we have Taylor Hall to slot in on the first line. Okay, that's okay. But their second line, if Hall slots up, becomes uh, Howla, DeBrusque, and Ma and um, Coyle. And if DeBrusque is injured, who slots up? I don't, Trent Frederick, Thomas Nosek. I don't know about the Bruins. Jeremy Swayman has been very hot as well. To, and well, he's well. Both goalies have been good this season, both with under two and a half goals against per game, both with solid save percentages. Whoever plays, they split exactly 41-41. Whoever plays between Allmark and Swayman, I believe will do well. I don't know, Swayman played, I think, the majority down the stretch, if I recall correctly, but I'm not sure who's going to start the series. You know, they picked up Hampus Lindholm. He's been injured. He only played 10 games. He has five assists. I think he's coming back for the beginning of the series. Not totally sure. 
But uh, yeah, the Bruins are a solid team. It's just I think the Hurricanes are more well-rounded, especially on their blue line for points for offensive and defensive capabilities. D'Angelo, Slavin, Shea and Pesci, Cole and Bear. Plus you have Smith down here as depth as well. I think that the Hurricanes take this. They have the stronger defensive core. I don't like the options as much for the Bruins if somebody falls out of the lineup. And again, you know, okay, how about nobody falls out of the lineup? Okay, both teams are at full strength for the full series. I still think the Hurricanes take it because of how well-rounded they are, even with Antti Ranta as the starting goalie for the entire series, perhaps. So I'm going to go with the Hurricanes on this one. The Bruins are going to make it a bit of a series. I could see this. I think it's going to go six games, but I don't see it going to seven. I think the Hurricanes will take it four games to two match up here analytics both teams pretty similar in the numbers the hurricanes have the edge for goals for and against by about 0.2 in both categories but for all those reasons i just said i think the hurricanes take it finally now we have a, probably one of the better matchups as well i'm gonna be very excited to watch this one the rangers and the penguins the new york rangers had crazy years from a lot of guys you know chris Kreider, 52 goals out of nowhere Panarin had another good campaign at 96. Zibanejad point per game, 81. I think some people thought the last couple of years have been a bit of a fluke for Zibanejad, but he continues to perform. Adam Fox, 74 and 78. Ryan Strom, you know, a quiet 50 plus point year, a 20 and 30 type of year. Truba, not there, you know, 39 points, whatever, but he blocks a ton of shots. He eats a lot of minutes. But after that's where things start to drop off for the Rangers a little bit. Yes, I have Barkley Goodrow in depth. Yes, Lafreniere is heating up a little bit. Kondre Miller eats a lot of minutes as well. Kopp was a great pickup, 18 points in 16 games. Kako has never quite found himself 18 points in 43 games this year. Yes, Ryan Lindgren eats a lot of minutes as well. I, I like New York's defense, I think, more than Pittsburgh's. You got Fox and Truba, Miller and Lindgren. That's an elite, elite, I say, top four. Uh, but after that, I don't know. I don't know. You have the big dogs scoring. In the playoffs, you got to have guys who can slot in, and you got to have depth scoring, defense, goaltending, you gotta have depth. That's the word in the playoffs. That's why, thankfully, even though the Rangers may be struggling a bit in the depth scoring, they have the Vezina and Winner, who's gonna get some heart votes in Igor Shesterkin. 36, 13, and 4, 2.07 goals against, 935 save percentage. You take him out for a game or for a period or whatever happens, Georgiev, almost three goals against and under a 900 save percentage. I don't know, that scares me a little bit. But at the same time, you have Panarin, you have Zibanejad, you have 50-goal Chris Kreider, you have almost point-per-game Adam Fox. Is that going to be enough to beat the weathered veteran Pittsburgh Penguins? I don't know. The Penguins are notorious for showing that they can have guys who slot up. Crosby's out for a little bit. Bang. Evan Rodriguez comes up in the lineup. He scored like 30 points in 30 games or whatever. Now he's slowed down in the second half. But just to say, he was capable of doing it. Malkin came back from injury, went over a point per game. Jeff Carter turned back the clock. Ryan Brian Rust, almost point per game. Chris Letang. People said he was done. I never lost hope in Chris Letang. Letang, one of the best defensemen in the NHL when he is healthy. That's the biggest problem. And he was healthy this year, 68 points, bang. Jake Gensel, a quiet 40-goal year. I don't think many people are talking about a 40-goal, 84-point season from Jake Gensel and another, hey, 84-point year from Sid the Kid. Again, looking at the depth scoring, though, Danton Heinen, Kasperi Kapanen struggling a little bit. Uh, Teddy Bluger, Jason Zucker, not a great year. Rickard Raquel, though, a fantastic pickup at the deadline, 13 points in 19 games. So although it's not the greatest names on paper, it's hard to bet against the Pittsburgh Penguins with the players that they have in Crosby and Malkin, plus how somehow this team turns, like, Brian Dumoulin into, like, an elite defenseman in the playoffs. I don't know, every year they somehow do it. So am I looking a bit into the past that is affecting my thoughts in the current, in the present day? Yes, absolutely. They've done it in the past so well, where, you know, Dumoulin's going to turn into, like, a Norris candidate in the playoffs. Zucker's going to go a point per game. Malkin and Crosby are going to get like hat tricks every night right of course not i'm not being serious but just to say that's the type of pittsburgh team that we have seen in past years and everyone's currently at full health crosby's here malkin's here latang is here tristan jerry is the biggest issue because everything else i just said points to pittsburgh over new york tristan jerry out for a little bit no one really knows exactly when he's coming back i believe he's still week to week with a broken foot and you know even if he did came come back uh, casey de smith maybe he's the guy uh, he's been okay. He's been okay. 2.79 goals against average, a 914 save percentage. Only, only you know, 0.005 less than uh, Tristan Jerry. So I could see Casey DeSmith 
you know, standing on his head. Casey DeSmith has been known. It's going to be his first time playing in the playoffs, but he's been known to perform when called upon. He has a record of 43, 28, and 11 in his career. He's always had a winning record as a backup. He's been very consistent for the Penguins, and I think this is going to be his opportunity to show himself a little bit because he's been in the shadow of other guys in past years. So I think the Penguins take this one. The Rangers are a very strong team. Sorry for all the Rangers fans out there. Shesterkin's going to stand on his head. I think he's going to outduel DeSmith for sure. And I think the blue line of the, of the Rangers is a little bit, uh, has a bit of the edge as well. But I think the Penguins at full health, I think Crosby, Malkin, and Gensel in this playoff series are going to outperform Panarin, Zibanejad, and Kreider. Maybe they didn't in the regular season, but it's something in my gut's telling me, and that's why it's a predictions, you know? I'm not saying who's the better team. I'm saying who do I think will win the series. The Penguins scored a little bit more. They let in a little bit more. But I think the defense in Pittsburgh has a way of turning on the Jets when the time comes. So I'm going to say Pittsburgh takes it. In these matchups, I said the Panthers are going to win it in seven, I think. The Capitals are going to give them a run for their money. The Lightning are going to take this series against the, the, the Leafs. I didn't say how many games, I don't think. And I don't mean to insult anybody, but I think the Lightning take it in five games. I think so. Uh, the Hurricanes and the Bruins, I think that the Bruins will give them a bit of a run for their money. We'll go to six games. And the Penguins and the Rangers is going to be a seven-game thriller with Pittsburgh taking it in the end. So after that, we can go through the matchups a little bit more quickly since we know about every team now. And you know, now we're going down like if this happens and if, if this happens and if, if, if this happens. So of course, by the end of the first round, I'll have another video on the second round. But as of now, just for my bracket to finish bringing this to a close, Avalanche and the Wild in round number two. I think that the Avalanche take this one, not just because they're the best team in the West right now, but I think this might be like an offensive blowout type of series where you're gonna have McKinnon, Rantanen, Landeskog, Makar, they're all scoring multi-point games. Kap Kaprizov, Fiala, even Zuccarello, they're gonna have multi-point games, but I think that Avalanche will just have a little bit more firepower. I think these are gonna be barn burner type games. I don't see this being a highly defensive series. And I think the Avalanche take it basically, uh, based purely off of the offensive metrics. I see the Avalanche going to the Western Conference Finals and taking down the Minnesota Wild in a six-game barn burner type series. I don't think it'll be tight overtime games that go to seven. I think it'll be like a, you know some some six fours with some empty netters, some five twos, some five threes, games like that. You know, is that, maybe that's not a barn burner. Like if you define a barn burner as a nine six type of game, but then you know I'd say the winning team scores four five six goals per night. It's not going to be two one and three one three two kind of games in my opinion. Of course, that's looking deeply into the future. Now, Battle of Alberta in round number two, Calgary and Edmonton. Once again, two very highly offensive teams. But I think the biggest discrepancy here is the goals against. Almost more than a half goal against less per game in the Flames right there. Mike Smith, I wouldn't be surprised if he has a little thing in the hip. Uh, if he has a little something of an injury. Markstrom's going to keep staying strong, but Koskinen's going to go in there perhaps. And Goudreau and Kachuk, they're going to keep going and going. I don't think the Oilers are going to be able to break through that blue line of Hannafin and Anderson and Tanev and Shillington and everybody as easily as the Flames will break through CC and Kulak and Russell and you know even Tyson Berry if uh, Darnell Nurse is not back so I think the Flames take this one and I you know after a tough game series against the Kings I think I see this one being more of a four or five game series as opposed to a six or seven so of course oh look the top two teams in the Pacific and the Central are facing off against each other how often does that happen not super often but I think that the Avalanche and the Flames are on a collision course they have they both have the offense and the strong enough defense to get there now we'll analyze that matchup in a moment over in the Eastern Conference, the Battle of Florida between the Panthers and the Lightning. This is another very, very difficult one as the Panthers are such a high scoring team, but I think the Lightning will have the edge defensively. I think Vasilevsky is going to turn it on while who knows really about Bobrovsky who's more of a wildcard factor and will potentially be finding himself in the second round of the playoffs for the first time in his career. I think the Lightning beat the Panthers, what was it, in six games last year on the road to the Stanley Cup? Yeah, and there were some 6-5 games in there. There were some 4 nothing, 4-1 games in there. So this series really could go either way. And I think, I think the winner of this one probably represents the East either way in the Stanley Cup final. 
but Panthers and Lightning, it's really a toss-up right now. Definitely a seven-game series. And it depends on injuries, players coming back and all that. And I really want to give it to Florida for guys like Joe Thornton and Claude Giroux. Such good stories. That's hard to bet against a team going for a third Stanley Cup. They have two. They have the experience. They beat this team already. Yes, maybe you say, okay, well, they beat this team already. Florida knows how to make the changes, the necessary changes to beat Tampa this time. But the team changes every year. Now Tampa's depth is now Ross Colton and um, Nick Paul and all these guys, while simultaneously having Stamkos and Kucherov being white hot. So I think I, I'm going to go Tampa here. But if any of these, of all the bracket series and the ifs and the what ifs, if any of them could be the by 0.00001%, I think this is the one here. I have Tampa beating Florida, but oh, that's going to be tough. I'm, I'm looking forward to reanalyzing it in the next video and the video after that should Tampa Bay continue. But for right now, without seeing any with the puck having not dropped in the playoffs yet, I think Tampa is going to take it. Now, Hurricanes and Penguins. The Hurricanes are the higher scoring team and the better defensive team. Uh, but again, it's hard to bet against the experience of the Pittsburgh Penguins, especially when they turn it on. But it is hard to bet against the Pittsburgh Penguins. It might just really come down to the goaltending here. Is it going to be Antti Ranta versus Casey DeSmith? Or is it going to be Freddie Anderson versus Tristan Jari? That's a big, big question. It's tough to be deciding that so far in the future. You gotta make some hot takes out here. You can't just go first team, first team, first team. Oh, uh, what a surprise. I have Colorado, Calgary, Florida, and Carolina in my top four. No, you gotta make some hot takes once in a while. I'm locking in the Penguins. I think the Penguins, I have, they're gonna do it. They have such depth. They have such experience of veterans. I'm hyping them up for a first round exit, but here we go. So I see Penguins and Lightning, both third place teams in their divisions, taking each on each other in the Eastern Conference. And then the first place teams, the Avalanche and the Flames, taking on each other in the Stanley Cup Final. Uh, excuse me, in the Conference Final. So now the Avalanche versus the Flame. This is going to be the matchup that everyone gathers around the radio for in the parlor. After the cows are milked and the chickens have been fed, you'll get your little pillow on the floor and you'll turn on that transistor radio and you're going to listen to one of the better matchups i think of the last few years avalanche and flames again i don't want to go into huge breakdowns because it's so far in the future and who knows if it even happens but between the avalanche and the flames there is a lot of firepower in calgary uh, i think i like the flames blue line more if it comes down to okay yes there's kale mccarr and devon Tays, crazy Samuel Girard, eh? Eric Johnson, meh. And Bowen Byram, okay, he's back from injury. That's good. Jack Johnson, meh, okay. But Josh Manson, big pickup for the team at the deadline, yes. But I gotta say, I'm very, very impressed by Rasmus Anderson, Noah Hannafin, Oliver Shillington, Christopher Tanev, even Zadarov has been pretty solid. Eric Goodbranson has been out there. Bye, bye, Eric Goodbranson. If you know, you know. Shout out to anyone who knows Parks and Rec. Little Sebastian, rest in peace. So it's, I think it comes down to the blue line. Because again, both teams are going to be super offensive. Just like the last matchup with the Avalanche. It's going to be McKinnon, Kadri, Rantanen, Landeskog, Burakovsky versus Kachuk, Toffoli, Goudreau, uh, Backlund, uh, Lindholm. It's going to be those guys going up against each other. The team with the better blue line goaltending, and I think the Flames blue line and Jacob Markstrom outdoes the Avalanche's blue line and Darcy Kemper. So it's going to be heartbreak, but I think I see the Calgary Flames advancing to the Stanley Cup Final for the first time since 2004. And speaking of 2004, the Lightning may want to go there once more, but they'll have to take on the Pittsburgh Penguins. So the Penguins, I've been hyping them up a lot. When it comes down to the numbers here, they're actually very, very similar. Goals against are very close. Lightning are the slightly higher scoring team. Can the Penguins, after like let's say a seven and seven, let's say you know through fourteen games, maybe they're coming in here. The Lightning may probably have the easier first round, but a very tough second round. Are they still going to be at their fullest? Will their depth be slotting in at this point? Same question goes for the Pittsburgh Penguins. I think at this point, if Tristan Jarry's not back with his broken foot, I think that's this is where Casey DeSmith maybe starts to get exposed a little bit. 
And without going into too much analyst analytics here, I think that the Lightning are going to get through against the Pittsburgh Penguins. They're going to have a Cinderella run, taking on you know underdogs against the Rangers and Hurricanes, but I don't think they're going to be able to take down the Lightning, who are going to advance for a 2004 Stanley Cup Final rematch. The Flames and the Lightning battling it out for the Stanley Cup. Points per game, goals per game, Flames have the edge. Goals against per game, Flames also have the edge. There's so much, so, so many good things to say about this team. People are laughing about the Flames being the possibly the best team to come out of Canada this year. The Flames are a powerhouse, even without Sean Monaghan, who just disappeared this year with his injuries and all that. Blake Coleman is going to become a juggernaut in the playoffs where he scores 33 points in a year, but he's going to score like 20 points in 25 games in the playoffs, right? But here's the thing about the Lightning at this point. Their last two Stanley Cups, I believe their first Stanley Cup was in 21 or 22 games. And their second Stanley Cup, I think it took them 23 games. But assuming that it takes them five against the Lightning, seven against the Panthers, and maybe another seven against the Penguins, we're already at 19 games. Make this a six or seven game series, they're going to be going to 25, 26 games played. So the Lightning are going to be tired at this point. It's never taken them this long to win a Stanley Cup. The Flames are going to be five games against the Stars, four or five games against Edmonton, then a seven-game thriller against the Avalanche, perhaps, six or seven games there. Yes, they're a bit more tired, but they have more in the tank. And ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to lock it in. The Calgary Flames are my choice for the 2022 Stanley Cup at this point. Of course, they lose in the first round. I'm going to have a new choice by next episode. But as of this first round, before the puck has dropped, the Calgary Flames, I believe, will take it. Uh, I already calculated a bit of a number that I had in my head for like a few games that go 3-2, a few games that go 4-3, 6 to whatever. I'm going to say a solid 42 goals are scored in this uh, final, in this uh, Stanley Cup final. I have read and agreed to all the rules, and I will submit my choices the pick is the picks are in the stanley cup is returning to canada and the flames are my choice so now if you would like to join this league i would love to have you in here as many people as possible make it a fun time the winner of this bracket challenge will get what the winners of the fantasy league get which is a created player in the next series that we do that may not be until nhl 23 actually because the next series of nhl 22 franchise mode will start soon but regardless you will get a created player with say medium uh franchise potential that will be put into free agency uh, whatever name you want whatever height whatever player type whatever uh x factors it'll be an 85 overall 18 year old with medium uh, franchise potential or 80 excuse me 83 overall and that is what is up for grabs here in this challenge so if you want to join the challenge the link to join is in the discord server on the announcements page on the tab of announcements on the server so in the description and in the comments the top comments pinned comment i will put the link for the discord server join there and then you'll click on the link to join the league and then once you join the league, I'll put you in a separate channel where we can have all private discussions, just those of us who join, whether we're 10, 20, 30, 40 people who join. And we can discuss and have banter and uh, enjoy the playoffs all together there. And just on top of that, the Discord server is a really fun place where we talk sports, baseball, hockey, fantasy sports, uh, franchise mode as well. So that would be a great opportunity for you to join there too. So... With all that being said, I will wrap it up on the Data 782 Challenge bracket right there. There are my choices. Which ones do you agree with? Which ones do you not agree with? Which ones are a bit too crazy? What are your hot takes? What are what takes of mine are a bit too hot, perhaps? We'll see. And I'm looking forward to following this up in the next episode when we analyze the first round and predict the second round. But here are my predictions for the 2022 NHL playoffs. I hope that you enjoyed. If you did, be sure to leave a like and don't forget to subscribe as well. You can be aware of all these uploads, the data casts, as well as NHL 22 franchise mode, NHL 07 dynasty mode, FIFA 22 career mode. Lots of series here on the channel that is just heating up as we're heading into the summer months as uploads are coming fast fast and furious so you don't want to miss them and the team here on the channel will be that much stronger with you a part of it so we'd love to have you join in all that being said thank you so much for taking the time to listen and i look forward to reading your thoughts and seeing you again in the next one